every time I'd see Phil, he, he'd always have one question for me and he'd say, Ron, do you know what the secret to life is? And I'd say, first time I didn't know, every other time I did. He said, the secret to life is style. Welcome to Tip Top, grow up your business with Metronomics. Join me, Shannon Burns-Husco, and Metronomics certified coach, Jed Roberts. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, stories, on how you can grow your company up at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top, and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. Today, I'm with Ron Huntington. Ron is a fellow metronomics coach based in in Seattle in Washington. Well, yeah, I tell you what, ever since you and I first met, the beauty of what we do and, and, and the beauty of the organizations we belong to is we learn from each other. I was impressed with you from the very first day we met and you've just added value every day since in every one of our encounters. And so uh, I think that's the, the beauty of what we do is we gain energy and inspiration from each other. And then it's passing it on so we can help those CEOs maximize their performance and the performance of their teams. You know, we end up being kind of models of one another's strengths uh, across the line. I've learned from you. Uh, hopefully I pass some things on to you in return. It's a real good give and take relationship. And ultimately the giving occurs when we get face to face with our clients and compound the value of what we've learned, what we've experienced. And it it gives us a chance to apply, I think, a combination of of, of the skills that I think are required to answer your question. How do we maximize CEO performance? And, and I think we talk about uh, the four elements are trust building. How do we how do we gain the CEO's confidence and trust that when we share something with them, they are listening They're As you were in that first encounter, your first year in the coaching business, Jed, you were hanging on every word. You were trying to pull every ounce of inspiration and every kernel of knowledge and experience out of every one of us. And so, you know, we're hoping that our CEOs have that same outlook. So it's it's gaining that trust. It's having wise relationship development skills to pass along um, in the process uh, so that you know, you and I both know that the, the, the secret of a very long engagement where you can really compound your contributions to the client's success is in building that bulletproof relationship over time. And then I think the thing that adds value to a strong relationship is having the ability to learn a lot and then and then offer seasoned, objective, high value guidance and and some really expansive cross industry experience uh, ac- across industry lines, so that you're not just a specialist in what they do. Uh, it's a specialist that brings added value from what other industries. Well, what what I think we've discovered over the 33 years that I've been doing this is is you know the the rules of business apply almost universally across industry lines i mean there there's a, a a basic function of running a successful business and uh, how many hundreds and hundreds and thousands of books have been written trying to pass on the secret of of that experience so so that's what i see as kind of the the way forward to maximizing ceo performance and we'd like to talk about you know, all four of the elements. Ultimately, what comes down to is, you know, each of us has a little different approach. What I'm here to do, Jed, is to share with you and the other coaches and, and, and anyone, else, anyone else who is interested in this topic to to learn from you and I having this great conversation. Well, I, I think that's, um, that's really set the scene for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. On this podcast, we've covered a whole bunch of topics all centered around the metronomics um, growth system, the you know the growth operating system. Uh, and today, what I want to spend some time talking with you today is how to maximize CEO performance as a coach. But before we do that, why don't you take a step? Why don't we take a step back and maybe you can outline uh, how you got to where you are right now? You know how you started in life, uh, your early career, and just give us a sort of you know, a brief rundown of you know what brought you to to where you are right now. Well, that's a good long story. Um, as some would say, it's a very interesting journey. 
uh, I started getting comfortable with selling when I was uh, 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 four and five years old. I was selling flowers in my grandmother's flower farm uh, out in Sumner, Washington. So I gained a comfort with selling early. Uh, what I didn't have and I learned along the way was uh, I needed to pick up the experience and knowledge to be able to sell something that is as intangible often as what we do, which is selling coaching and, and selling our experience to people who need guidance in growing an enterprise. So I went to the University of Washington uh, in Seattle and uh, uh, from there put myself through school working in a number of different entrepreneurial uh, jobs, but ultimately I ended up following a young lady into the restaurant business and put myself through college uh, uh, waiting tables of all things. And so uh, I had an interest in film and video production uh, along the way, got out of school, wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, I got into the restaurant business, hospitality business, as a, a manager for an organization in Seattle. And they took me to Anchorage, Alaska, uh, where I got out on my own, uh, developed uh, an organization with three restaurants that I helped create and start. And then we got into a fisheries development business um, in Alaska. So I, I've been an entrepreneur a uh, good portion of my life in various uh, facets. In 1990, I got into the coaching business with an organization in Seattle called the Pacific Institute. It was personal growth education more than business growth education. And after about a year, year and a half with that organization, I had an opportunity to really get into business consulting with another organization called MAP. And MAP, I had a mentor there named Don Lusk. And Don Lusk actually showed me how to do this business and do it independently and uh, and do it successfully. So along that path, I just got uh, exposure to a lot of really good mentoring from people I respected. Uh, met Vern Harnish uh, in uh, 1999. He and I became uh, uh, close associates along the way. That's where we started the organization that you came into in 2016. Uh, it was Gazelles International Coaches and then Scaling Up Coaches along the way. And then since then, you and I have migrated to uh, Shannon's metronomics platform. And I think both of us are are big fans and strong proponents of the work that metronomics does. So that's that's the path. And it's been uh, it's been engaging every step of the way. A lot of great friendships come out of it. A lot of clients that I've been friends with for years and years, in, in several cases, decades. Yeah. And I think that the, uh, the, you know, the energy that I get from that um, and, and I won't tell you how old I'm going to be this year, but it's, it's old, Jed, it's old. And, uh, but it, I find that this business actually keeps me young, young of mind, young of spirit and, and young of heart. So it allows us, I think, to extend our contributions, uh, well beyond our, our useful, uh, life here in the industry. So more gray hair we have, Jed, I, I see you got years in this, uh, Turn yeah, a little, yeah, yeah. a coming. little on the gray it's around coming. that around the edges there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, there's there's power in that gray hair, Jed. Power. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, m my financial advisor asked me last year when I was going to retire, and my answer to him is, "When am I? Why would I retire? Why would I retire? There's there's absolutely no need for me to retire. I love what I do, and all the time I can give value to to CEOs and leadership teams. I'll keep on doing that." And by the way, who's working? This isn't work. This is, is this is uh, this no. is fun. Okay, so so Ron, in your in your in your discovery of how to maximize CEO performance, you know, you've developed a four step framework for maximizing CEO performance. Do you want to take us through each of those steps? So maybe you know, as, as we often do, let's start with number one, and then let's do number two, and then three, and then four. Take us through. Yeah, regrettably. Jed, I'm a linear guy by nature. I'm not sure why, but it's it's checklist driven. So so the first step of the four, uh, and of course, all relationships, as my mentor said, begin with trust. Uh, you've got to get someone on the other side of a relationship that uh, that likes you, first of all, enough to open the door and have a conversation with you. And and from there, you take it forward and you, I think it's, you, you lay the foundation and the foundation is building trust. I think it's, it's, the foundation of any effective coaching relationship. I think CEOs, as you can probably attest, by nature, are often isolated in their decision making and and, and kind of kind of guarded oftentimes around the key players because they've been burned oftentimes by P 
people they've trusted too quickly, too freely, and too deeply. And so consequently, I find that the more a CEO is seasoned in their role, trust is a much more difficult um, um, element to obtain, particularly when you're coming in cold from the outside. The good news is that for you and for me, most of our introductions to new prospect, uh, prospective customers is through referrals. Um, and so that helps a lot. However, you know, th there are a, a few pillars of building trust that I think are important to cap capture here. The first one being transparency. I think you have to be transparent. You have to get people to drop their guards pretty quickly in order to be effective quickly as well. So what I do is I start out by sharing our process. And with me right now, it's a combination of two different programs that I use, which I lead with metronomics. And I also have another colleague, Keith Cup, who has a f organization called Gravitas. And, and I use a fair amount of the Gravitas material. So it's kind of an interwoven process, a, a hybrid process, but it is probably 80% more or, or more metronomics based at this point. You know, my philosophy is very straightforward. I, 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 my, my job is to, um, my, my purpose and my job is to be undeniably useful and impactful with my clients. And so when we sit down for initial conversation, I want them to know where I'm coming from. My, my interest is in meeting their needs, whatever those would be as we get better acquainted, uh, both on a personal and a professional level. So how can my philosophy help them get what they want out of their life and out of their business. So that is an important initial foundation. That's also about vulnerability, establishing vulnerability between you and the CEO. Is, is that right? Yes. And, I, and you sound like a man who's speaking from experience as well. So um, I think what I look to do and, and what I'm sure many of our other fellow coaches do is, a, is to create a clear, open line of communication. And, you know, so it, there's an initial dance that takes place. Uh, a lot of times people are reluctant to dance. They're reluctant to, you know, engage in a meaningful rhythmic conversation to kind of open things up. But that's kind of the first step, in my opinion, is are they going to be open with you? Are they going to tell you the truth? Or are they like a lot of people? Are they guarded, protective, and unwilling to really open up so that you can fully help them by understanding what they're going through, what their needs are, what their issues are, and, and what their dreams and goals and priorities are that they're conscious of. A lot of times, they're not that clear at that point in the conversation. Um, and other times, they're very clear. And so that helps guide the process forward. The other thing that I think is important, um, you know, being vulnerable is one thing, but they need to know early on, the second element of building trust is confidentiality. I tell them early on, Jed, that my commitment to confidentiality would be the same that their lawyer or their accountant has, uh, that this is a privileged conversation. I won't take it any further. I won't share the conversation unless I have their expressed permission to do so. And if I can be of help in facilitating a conversation and I need to break that barrier of confidentiality to have an effective conversation, I told them I will not do that unless we have an agreement between us that I can share this information. The next element is consistency, uh, you know, and that is showing up consistently so that uh, they will be receptive to your advice and feedback so that you've developed a rhythm of communication that, that, that creates dependability in their mind and it strengthens the trust that people have in the relationship. So, that is important. And the other thing that I think all of us as coaches need to be working on every day is how do we become a more thorough and effective communicator? Uh, and so when I enter into a new relationship, as I'm sure you and other colleagues do, we do our homework. So I want to know with whatever means that I have available, uh, you know, LinkedIn and other resources are out there, but I want to be able to communicate from day one with a purpose. I want to be able to have them understand what, what, why I'm doing this, and I want to understand why they're doing the business that they're in and, and really what their long-term goals are that they want to, to achieve. So it's being clear 
And I think many of us have have a problem with being concise and direct. Um, but we certainly, I, I try and and use that as a guideline. Is a guideline is uh, be as concise and direct as possible. Um, and then and then use. You have to be a student of communication. I think in our business, and so it's it's understanding how do people communicate, what's their preferred mean of a means of receiving and giving information. You know, we've got the auditory, we've got the visual, we've got the kinesthetics, we've got nonverbal cues by the by the bushel basket, and so I, I want to be able to read the signs as I'm communicating and and find a way to make sure that we are connecting in the communication and that I'm meeting as best we understand it, their preferred means of not only receiving information, but giving information back in, in the process. So, so th those are the four main pillars that I have in my methods for building trust. Yeah. So summing those up, that's all around transparency, con confidentiality, um, consistency, and also thorough communication. How do you, how do you communicate with the CEO in a way that, that works best for them? Yeah, and and begins to strengthen the bonds in the relationship. So so they they say basically, ah, this person understands me. They get me. They understand how we can connect and communicate most effectively. And that then releases some of that tension and energy as you're starting the relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So that's step one. That's step one. So the second element. Uh, of the four is developing a close relationship. And of course, that takes time, oftentimes. Uh, what we try and do, though, is shorten the cycle time to creating and developing a close working relationship. The closer that that relationship becomes, the longer you have to deliver the full value in the relationship from the coach's end to the client. And so, you know, as a coach, I think you're looking to be a key partner in the CEO's growth, both personally and professionally. And so a close professional relationship, which is usually where this starts, then can can help drive meaningful change and then personal and professional growth for the CEO or the client and their team, for that matter. And, and I think it will help improve organizational and leadership team cohesion, as well as performance, which is really why you're being brought in to the engagement in the first place. They're hoping you can do something for them that will give them, and this is what I pitch early on, is, uh, you know, I want you to get a measurable return on whatever investment you make in our relationship. And we'll measure that in very exacting terms. One of the beauties of the metronomics platform is it holds people accountable to metric performance. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I moved to Shannon's organization when she first opened it. You know, it was a little bit, uh, it was new at that point. I think you were also, you were quick on the uptake, were you not, Jed? Yeah, absolutely. As, as soon as I could, as soon as I could. I mean, we'd both been following Shannon's work for a while. And uh, um, I, I remember at the, um, the conference in New Orleans in 2018, you know, asking a question to Shannon, you know, would you consider um, starting up a, a coaching organization and the answer was unequivocally uh, no no way i'm a coach i just coach ceos and then six months later we set up the coaching organization and i know it and so you had a, an instrumental role you know i was there i was caught in the middle of a of a of a uh, of a street fight going on at the time but I, I i was immediately drawn to shannon's superior systems that uh, that that caught my attention even before the coaching organization was formed uh, particularly on the strategy side, which are extremely strong. So one of the things that I do in developing a close relationship is I, I front and center the power of metronomics and their strategy, the differentiating strategy component to a CEO to then develop this closer communication and this closer um, dialogue about where they really want to grow their business and how are they going to break through some of the barriers that hold a lot of other companies back. So, you know, part of it is then uh, having these tools that we have and knowing when to position them, when to play them out of the metronomics toolkit so that we can engage a CEO's creativity and their desire to use the tools and grow the company using the tools with their, with their organization. So 
I, I find that initially then, part of developing a close relationship, step one is you've got to become an active and a very patient listener. The old 80-20 rule applies as my mentor, Don Luska, says, spend 80% of your time listening and the other 20% not telling, but asking really powerful questions to help coalesce your clients, in this case, the CEO's understanding of themselves, the capabilities of their team, the capabilities of their entire business model and enterprise, and where they really want to put the energy and time into growing to a level of potential. So whatever that potential is, we need to help define that using the tools in the Metronomics Toolkit. So, so that is important, understanding their unique pressures that they're under, you know, having been a CEO ourselves uh, in various capacities, you know, we can relate to what they're feeling in terms of pressures, what the challenges, what the opportunities, what the goals are that are out there. So the other side of, of listening is being able to empathize without being patronizing. And so demonstrating, you know, genuine empathy and a deep understanding of their individual situation will help build that rapport, that connection. It'll break down those barriers, you know, that usually occur. It's been a long time since you and I dated, I'm guessing, Jed. But, you know, I, I, I remember how awkward that was back in, in the in when I was when I was a youth. Uh, and uh, and so it's important to be able to say, well, we remember what that was like. And so you can build the bonds that can then be deepened over time. Well, once that is done, then I think the important thing is, you know, um, um, you know, my purpose is to be undeniably useful and impactful. And so how can I then tailor my support, tailoring the support to those unique CEO uh, needs, their personalities, their leadership style, the business context that they find themselves in, the specific industry and what cycle it's going through as the economy, you know, ebbs and flows, and, 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 and making sure that they see you as, again, undeniably useful and impactful and helping them get to where they want to go. That's kind of the tailored support approach that I take. And then, and this is the hard part in today's world. Everybody's so darn busy. I think it's regular check-ins with probing thoughtful questions and conversations is what really enhances the relationship for that CEO who is out there oftentimes feeling like it's it's a lonely world. I'm, I'm the only one who understands this. I'm the only one who is driving this you know, with the level of urgency that I want. And so, you know, you, we've seen that before how many times. They're, they're, they're frustrated in that people aren't moving at the speed of sound or Mach 3, as the case may be. Um, so we're, the, we're there to offer, you know, more than just uh, strategic insights and encourage self-awareness and, and personal development. We're there to really ask powerful questions and, and go deeper, perhaps, than any of the conversations they're having with anyone on their existing team. And that, I think, is is part of, uh, again, developing that close relationship. So, so Ron, how, how often do you check in with your CEOs? I mean, I, I try and speak to my CEOs at least every two weeks, uh, but sometimes the whirlwind gets in the way and uh, that, that cadence sort of you know, falls, uh, falls away. Uh, and, I mean, that's, that's something that I'm sort of you know, trying to sort of you know, push back into my coaching practice, you know, the, the rigor of sticking to that, two weekly cadence. How about you? What is, what's the cadence you follow? About every two to four weeks. Um, you know, I, I set it up in my, my fee structure that I, I, I literally, I, there's no contract. And I set the expectation that, you know, you're paying either for a daily rate, which is not, not cheap, or they've got the, the, the full um, service model that Shannon introduces most of us to. So it's a combination of one or the other. I, on both of them, I say, look, what you're buying is access. If something comes up, I expect you to pick up the phone or ping me and let me know that you've got something you want to talk about. Don't shortchange yourself by not taking advantage of that offer. It's built in to our relationship. Uh, and so if something comes up, let me know. We'll get together in in expeditious manner to have a conversation and figure out what we need to do what the next steps are, and to come up with a plan, okay? And so, so it's hard given the fact that that uh, they're often, you know, stretched. 
And so how much is too much? How little is too little? I use that open door approach, Jed, to make sure that they know I'm here for them basically 24-7, although I do encourage them from about 7 in the morning to anywhere between 7, 8 o'clock at night you know, to not have any reservation. Just ping me and we'll get in touch. However, you know, the phone rings at midnight. Am I going to pick that up on that call? Uh, I'll do my best. That's that's the approach. I, I follow I follow a similar similar model. Um, just just as an example, I've got a client. Um, he has a board meeting every, about every six weeks or so, and Sunday afternoon around four o'clock, he phones me. We talk for about an hour. Well, actually, we don't talk for about an hour. I listen for about an hour. He just talks rubbish for an hour, and at the end of that, he says, "That was so valuable. Thanks very much, Jed." And then he goes off to his board meeting first thing in the morning. He just needs to vent. He just needs to clear his head of his thinking. Uh, so I, I actually quite look forward to those six weekly conversations because, uh, you know, he obviously gets what he needs from the conversation. And I'm more than happy to just listen. And, and I want to jump back to a point you made earlier on around, you know, the 80-20 rule about listening 80% and only talking for 20%. But the important thing about that 20% is that you're not telling, you're asking. And this is something I see when new coaches come in, and most of us coaches have some sort of background in consulting, you know, and we've run businesses ourselves. And you know, the, as a new coach, the first thing you want to do is roll your sleeves up and dive in and, and show them how it's done. And as a coach, you can't do that. You've got to pull back. You've got to pull back and start asking questions rather than telling CEOs and leadership teams how to do it. You might have done it 10 times. You might be far better than them. But that's not the point. That's not your role. You're there to ask, not to tell. That's right. You're, you're to provoke thoughts uh, in the minds of your audience. And uh, you know, it takes me back to a line out of the Broadway music Hamilton when Aaron Burr first meets uh, uh, Hamilton and uh, they meet in a tavern. And his, his Burr's advice to Hamilton is smile more, talk less. And so... You know, it's it's the same approach, but it's it's listen more and talk less is the advice from from Jed and Ron. So anyway, I interrupted your flow there, Ron. Apologies, uh, but that takes us on to being a consumer professional. The next sub step. Yeah, and and that really is it's just been something that was been drilled into me over the course of you know my entire professional career is that uh, Don Lusk was very confident when he's told me early and says you you got to be a consummate professional in your conduct, your presentation, and your style. He said, you don't have to, you know, put on airs. You don't need to do things that aren't you. However, you do need to be a, a role model of positive professionalism and leadership in the interactions that you have with clients. You need to set the tone. And and really, you want to, um, uh, you want to become and be the level five leader that Jim Collins talks about, which is, you want to be able to convey the qualities that will build confidence and enduring greatness and in, in not only yourself and the way you conduct yourself, but also in your clients, because that will build confidence in the relationship too. And so it's, it's, a, it's a blend of, as Colin says, personal humility and a tough as steel combination of professional will and consistent self-discipline and execution. If you can look the part and act the part without looking ostentatious, you know, you don't need to drive the, the Ferrari. You don't need to drive, you don't have to wear the Rolex, you, you know, but, but having, you know, a, a decent appearance and having shine shoes and making sure that you look professionally groomed and you conduct yourself in a professional manner builds confidence among clients in the relationships. The one thing that, I, that I've struggled with though, I've got, I, as I get older, my clients many times are, are younger, okay? So their code of dress and conduct is a little bit different than what Don Lusk and I would have talked about for years. However, I think there's still a, a very important lesson here that you need to be the consummate professional um, and you still have to be yourself. You can, you know, look, presentable, you can give very professional presentations, and you and I have seen the difference that that makes in front of uh, the, the audience. And, and you have to have a style. My One of my other mentors, um, Phil Smart, was a, 
a car dealer here in Seattle. He was one of the original um, Mercedes dealers in the USA. And he was also part of George Patton's Third Army in World War II. Uh, right. But every time I'd see Phil, he, he'd he always have one question for me. And he'd say, Ron, do you know what the secret to life is? And I'd say, first time I didn't know, every other time I did, he said, the secret to life is style. And so what is your style in building relationships with people who appreciate style? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, we all work with sort of you know, a wide range of CEOs and, and that includes age ranges. And, you know, I, I have sort of you know, CEOs who are probably the same age as me or older. And, and then it might be appropriate to wear a jacket, a shirt and shine shoes. But yeah. I also have 20, uh, 20 something CEOs and I, I meet them where they are, you know, and uh, it's very, very hard to polish a pair of all birds. But, uh, you know, if that's what everyone is wearing, then I will um, I will sort of you know, dress to suit. I'm not that's right. changing myself. I'm just respecting what is their culture. Yeah, we are willful chameleons, I think, would be a way to describe it. We try and blend in and make people comfortable rather than uncomfortable having whatever style they're they're accustomed to. So the third element here is being an objective seasoned advisor, I think, in, in working effectively with CEOs. Um, I, I think over the course of our, our respective histories, each one of us has a little different level of objectivity, although we, we would hope to be fully objective, um, bringing different levels of experience and relatability are what I call our superpowers as coaches. And, and I think these are particularly important when working with top executives who are often surrounded by people with significant biases, self-interests, or as we've seen it how many times, Jed, graphically conflicting interests when we first get involved with their organizations. So, you know, we're putting on the, we're putting on the referee's black and white striped jersey to kind of come in and, and, uh, and sort things out, uh, help the CEO understand what he or she has and doesn't have in order to move forward towards their vision. So, you know, there are several different qualities that I think are important to being an objective and a seasoned advisor. First of all, is you have to have, and this is the value of what a coach can bring, a detached perspective. Um, I've got at any given time, 12 to 14 clients. Some of them are more frequent than others, but I can bring in a very detached perspective because I'm not dependent on that CEO for my job. Um, I can tell that CEO what he or she needs to hear and not what I believe they want to hear, as, as opposed to some of the employees that they have surrounding them on the executive team. So as someone outside the day-to-day -day operations of the business, uh, I think we are in a position to offer some relatively unbiased uh, we may not have the whole picture immediately, but some very unbiased observations and feedback, certainly to begin with. And, and then we can probe for clarity and truth as we, as we get more comfortable with the relationship. So I, I find it, it, in detached perspective, you do not want to hesitate in challenging their thinking, pointing out their, their scotomas or blind spots that they have, things that they just do not see. Or, or we, we're in a position to offer alternative viewpoints to them along the path. So I think that that's, that's an important part of being that seasoned objective advisor. Secondly is leveraging the experience that we've got in, in spades, uh, not only with ourselves, but we can call in our colleagues for guidance. Uh, you know, we've got our mastermind groups. We've got our, our close collegial engagements so we can pick up the phone and talk to somebody that's perhaps even wiser than we are about their take on a, a, a specific situation and, and gain new perspective to bring to the table from the outside, thereby leveraging our experience and our relationships in the market. So uh, that I think is value. The other thing that, that needs to happen, and they, they, need, uh, they need to appreciate this, is that in metronomics, we are driven by data and we deliver feedback with data-driven clarity that they may not be able to get on their own. So um, whether it's performance metrics, whether it's feedback from the CEO's team, whether it's benchmarks that we've set, whether it's other objective data points that we're bringing in from other industries that are relevant to their performance, you know, we can help reinforce 
our observations with data-driven feedback that is more difficult for them to refute. Um, you know, the the, uh, the thing that I see with a lot of CEOs, Jed, and you may too, is that sometimes they're into self-deception. The old book, Leadership and Self-Deception. So our job is to help them not deceive themselves into seeing things or making things up that are going to work against the outcomes that they want to achieve. So that's where I think that data-driven feedback is strong, and that's something we bring into the relationship. And then, and then the, the other thing that I think we can do, the fourth element here, is encourage reflection and a variety of different perspectives, not only from teammates who may have a great idea, but they just don't seem to have the CEO's ear or favor, and we're able to help guide them to seeing the value of other perspectives within their own team that might have greater value than they would than they would give it at any given point in time. So this improves decision-making quality, which is, again, part of our scorecard is, are they making good decisions and are they then you know, executing action plans that deliver the results? But it also fosters self-awareness. And I think in this sense, it helps them grow as a leader um, from the relationship that they have with us and these outside resources and, and influences that we can bring to the conversation. So, Ron, you, you have probably stepped into conversations with leadership teams many times where there is a glaring inconsistency in the story, the numbers, the debate, that no one is prepared to put their hand up and say, this doesn't stack up. And that's our role as coaches to be able to step into into that danger, to enter the danger, as Patrick Lencioni would call it, and flag up those inconsistencies because often it's clear as day, but no one's talking about it. Yeah, and and the art of what we do, some more than others, Jed, is you know we have a way of bringing those things into the conversation without turning everybody else off. Uh, yeah. our, our job is to facilitate a, an acceptance of, a, of a, a different point of view or a different idea on how to proceed or, or where there's a problem that nobody wants to acknowledge because to do so is just too painful for them to contemplate or navigate on their own. So that's our role. I mean, to, to be able to be that voice out of the wilderness that says, hold on a minute here. There's something that you all need to be aware of. Are you open to hearing a different perspective on what we think the problem might well be. So it's again, it's asking the question, and 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 once they allow you in, then you can be that voice, and you can just see a lot of the the fear and the anxiety start to melt away from the people who are totally fearful of broaching the subject to the CEO, fearing that it will cost them their job. So we can we can be that catalyst for reality checks and and get people to talk about things that they really do need to talk about as uncomfortable as it might be for them it's easy for us because again we are this we are this objective outside resource that doesn't need the work if they want to fire us so be it yep and as coaches we can ask questions from the position of you know i, I think you know someone coined it um a dumb curiosity you know uh, uh, how, how 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 does that work? I don't yeah. get that. Uh, but we can do that because we have that independent external view and we can ask those questions that no one else is prepared to ask. Yeah, you know, that, it, did they have the television show Columbo in Australia? Oh, well, I, they certainly did in the UK and I watched it a lot in the UK before I came out to Australia for sure. Okay, yeah. all right. Mm. So, you, so you know the rule. We're talking about we're, we're professional Columbos here. That's really what we are. Uh, we're, we're able to ask the questions and, and find a way to connect the dots uh, on the realities inside an organization in ways that the organization may be either regret, regret, uh, regretfully uh, afraid to do or uh, simply incapable of doing uh, on their own. So, so shall we move into the fourth of the, uh, of the elements, which is empowering ownership and accountability, which again is what holds many organizations back from really getting the results that they that they desire and and that's really what that's really what our 
you know, that that's the fourth leg of the stool here that um, I think gives us our superpowers uh, in abundance. And so, you know, I, I don't know how you approach your clients, but I tell new prospects in the opening rounds of our engagement, I said, look, I am not going to do this work for you. You as the CEO, you're responsible for, for the actions, decisions, and the company's success. So if you think I'm coming in to run your company, banish that thought. I'm not going to do that. I'm here to guide you and your team to embracing the actions, the decisions, and the plan for the company's success. Great companies put together great strategies. And in, and in metronomics, we call it a differentiated strategy that helps you stand out regardless of market conditions at any point in time in the economic cycle. And to be able to work through the, the cycles of, of uh, economic activity and to be able to thrive regardless of market conditions, much more so than your competition. So as your coach, I tell them, uh, you know, my role is to empower them to take ownership of their plan. I'll help you create it. I'll help you manage it to a degree that you want me involved. I'm going to give you the tools to drive this plan yourselves. And I want you to get the results. You can give me the credit simply by paying your invoice on time. And that to me attests to the fact that you appreciate what we do. Okay. So, uh, how do we how do we empower ownership and accountability? That's always the that's always the thing that CEOs struggle with in an initial conversation. It's like that they'll always always they'll nearly always say, "I can't seem to hold my leadership team to account, and they can't hold their teams to account." Can you help me with that? Yeah. So my response is, so your accountability your your, your team's accountability levels are lower than you'd like. Is is that what I'm hearing here? And, and and so we go back to and how long has this been a problem, Mr. Ms. C CEO? And, and so it opens up again. I want to know. I want to get them to the point where if accountability is is the barrier to execution for their organization, I want them to feel excruciating pain at this point in the conversation. I want them to, as Lencioni says, I want them to get naked in this conversation and tell me exactly how bad that pain is. I want them to show me the scars of what a lack of accountability has created for them, both personally and professionally. So, you know, we go back and say, so with that conversation having been held, with the pain being abundantly clear for both sides, I'm saying, okay, do you, how urgently do you want to solve this problem? Are you willing to do these things? And then we go through the metronomics model and we say, here's what it's going to take. Are you fully committed? I mean, obviously, this is a longer conversation. But are you fully committed to doing the work required to get these results? If you are, then we will find the tools that you can deploy to hold your entire team accountable. And if people try and sidestep the accountability, guess what we need to do? We need to swap out some players. And we'll make those decisions. And I'll help you make those changes. I'll coach you to make those changes uh, in, in our relationship, which again, they, they, then they begin to feel they don't have to figure it out by themselves. They've got someone who will help them figure it out. Although I say, I'm going to put the execution accountability squarely on your shoulders. Are you ready for that? Are you okay with that? If you are, then let's talk about how we go about this. So I don't know what, what outside the standard metronomics model you use, Jed, uh, to bring about the accountability, but I've, I've kind of brought in something that I found over time works really well. Probably you use something similar to it, but I, I use a process called the SPA accountability system, which is single point of accountability. Okay. Familiar with, yeah, you, you, do you use this a similar approach? No, no, I, I've not come across that. So I'm, I'm curious to hear more. Okay. So the framework allows whenever you set an action, so for every differentiator, we have a single point of accountability to drive it. And it's a single individual. Only one person is assigned to the role of SPA for each executable decision or action item that we set. And so the designated SPA, single point of accountability, they own it. They organize it. They orchestrate it. 
they drive it, and they drive the team. So they get to handpick who do you want involved to help you assemble and, and, and drive this outcome. So the SPA is clearly on the one-page plan on the, in the metronomics dashboard. So every, every differentiator, every annual goal, every quarterly goal, every departmental goal has an assigned SPA to it. And so when I say to the CEO, here's how you hold them accountable. And we go back to David Marquet's turn the ship around intentional leadership model. I say, you've got to let go. You've got to create the environment where they will own the accountability. They bring you the plan for execution. They bring you in the metronomics dashboard, their plan with due dates, with deliverables clarified, and they go through and they present to you how we're doing. Are we hitting our due dates and our deliverable commitments or not? So this SPA approach is something we actually learned in, in some form back under um, the Rockefeller habits and then the scaling up processes. But it, it is really a very specific part of my relationship. If they are unwilling to embrace the ownership, the single point of accountability ownership for each and every action they commit to, we're going to have problems. If there's more than one person, what do we know? Nobody's accountable. If there's no one assigned to accountability, no one's accountable. It's not going to happen. So, so that's the approach that I take. And how do you how do you differ in that, Jed? In in your approach to it, I, I don't think we differ at all. I just I just hadn't heard of it referred to as the SBA, the single point accountability model. Uh, so I do exactly the same. And you know, just re, re, restating what you just said a moment ago, if everyone's accountable, no one's accountable. One name. And teams often struggle with that. Oh, but you know, now the, but he needs to do that and she needs to do that. I said, yeah, well, that's responsibility. That's not accountability. Who's actually putting their hand up when it's not getting done on time? That's what I need to know. And that's what you need to know because you can't hold people to account unless there's a name there. Yeah, and the beauty of the metronomics dashboard, as you know, is that you can assign some accountabilities within a, a quarterly or an annual initiative. So, um, you know, so I find that it that the dashboard really is a great tool for being able to drive this single point of accountability concept into practice on a on a daily and a quarterly basis. So, yep, and it's reinforced by daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, and you know they have. Many, many opportunities to check in on progress so there's no excuses if something not, is not going to get done by the time it should be done. Well, and the beauty of it is what Shannon and her team have done. They've got all those elements are right there in Metronomics and the dashboard. I mean, you don't have to go looking for them. They're right there. You just have to get familiar with the tools and the navigation of what's available there in the, in the, uh, in the dashboard. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify for the listeners... The dashboard Ron's referring to is, is Metronome's software, which is a software tool that we use with our clients to manage accountability, just as Ron's outlined a moment ago. Yeah, good. So there's only really other two elements to, um, you know, the accountability uh, component here, which is empowering ownership and accountability. And that's, you know, our, our job as coaches is then to, to hand them the keys to the vehicle you know, be their driving coach and give them a chance to take it out on the track and and then and, and bring the vehicle up to speed. So that's part of the support we provide for navigating the uh, metronomics dashboard and also to help them get the rhythms in place to be able to have the communication, do the check-ins, do the check-offs. Are they hitting their marks or not? So in any learning experience where, where they're taking on new tools, new concepts, you know, we've got to encourage them to be resilient. That's that's the next element. Encourage resilience is one of the guidelines that I use. You want to help them navigate the setbacks that we know they're going to have. Execution is much harder than setting strategy, in my opinion. If teams fail over the last 33, 34 years that I've been doing this, Jed, and in the, in the years that you have, you know, great teams break down in execution. Uh, they can have the, the best playbook in, in, in the industry. If they can't execute, they're not going to get the results. So I help them navigate their setbacks and challenges uh, by helping build resilience into their teams, into themselves. Uh, and that goes with building confidence and, and mastering the tools. And then 
using our experience as coaches to guide them through difficult decisions or crises that come along with with greater composure, greater clarity, greater confidence, and uh, less stress. So that that all leads to you know, building the relationship out from the CEO and extending it to their entire team. So I think by combining the trust, building a close relationship with each of them to the extent that they are willing and open to it, um, I think we position ourselves as coaches as a key partner, not only to the CEO's ongoing success, but also to allowing themselves and their team to maximize their performance while maintaining an emphasis on personal growth as well as professional growth. Um, you know, so I want to know, I want to take a personal interest in each of them to the extent that they want to share their life, their story, their goals, their outcomes with me. But I, I had a conversation just yesterday with a client in Portland, Oregon, uh, and I had to reiterate at the end, and I do this pr pretty much every time when we, when we adjourn a session, I turn and look every one of the participants in the eye and I say, look, you have a resource here that not every organization has. You have me. Each and every one of you has me. And so if you have an issue and you believe I can help you with it, you are doing yourself and the organization a disfavor by not letting me know that you need to talk. And I said, I'm available, as I talked about it earlier, I'm available to each and every one of you. There's no extra charge for this. You reach out. I'll reach back, we'll have a chat, we'll make some decisions, and you'll feel better about yourself, your team, your company's future, and your own effectiveness as a leader within this organization. And, and, I, and I leave them with basically that, a, a, a similar um, closing each time I meet with a client and we complete a session. So that's it, Jed. Not that complicated in, in, in concept. Uh, it takes a little more to master it, but it, it's all masterable. It's in practice, it's infinitely harder than it is to, to listen to, for sure. But, but so you, you, you've outlined a four-step process that is clear and, and simple. Is, is there a book here? Yeah, I had this conversation with another client Monday night he, who's got a great concept for a book. And, and he said, I just don't know if I have time. I don't know if it's that high a priority. Uh, that's why... I love the podcast, Jed. Uh, I love the fact that we can share this. Maybe someone would like to co-author a book, and I can be uh, a, you know, a muse for them to be able to take some of these ideas that I've got and the experience that I've got and turn it into a book. And I'm happy to take um, you know second fiddle on the on the uh, on, on the cover or on the inside of the book to to uh, take credit for it. I I would have to, if you think there's value in something like this. We'll throw this out to the group and see if anybody else wants to take up the the Jed and Ron challenge on uh, on on a, on a book of uh, some of these topics. So, well, I, I think we should we should talk about that because I've got a slot for my next book starting next July. So um, we should talk about that. Knowing you, I'd be delighted if we were to collaborate on, on something like that, Jed. So uh, I'm going to give you a first crack at the uh, at the pinata here. So you decide whether this is something that that you want to sit down and talk further about. And anytime you're ready to talk, I'm ready to have the conversation. Okay, sounds good. That sounds good. So Ron, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Um, today, we've been talking about how to maximize CEO performance as a coach, uh, which is a topic we haven't had on a podcast before. So really interesting to, to hear your perspective, Ron. Really, really enjoyed that. Well, Jed, thank you for picking out this. Uh, thank you for picking out this topic. We, I gave you a whole laundry list of things, and this is the one you chose. And uh, I hope I've done justice to it. Well, I think it was a good choice. So, um, so yeah, I'm glad to glad to spend the time with you today. Well, I, I'm glad, always glad to spend time with you any any time. And actually, looking forward to uh, meeting up again in a few months' time in Whistler. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this proven 20-year-old system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments and suggest topics you'd love us to explore the next time. 
Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.